Well, good morning, Acton Bethel. Welcome to a beautiful, snowy, wintry day. Um, I think it looks beautiful out there. I hope everybody had an easy way to drive in. I would love to very much uh, welcome Pastor Sean Bricks and Jen and daughter Emily and husband. Bob, Kevin. Kevin. Perfect. Welcome. He came all the way from Peterborough this morning, so uh, so glad that they're here. Pastor Sean was a pastor here in Acton about 20 years ago, so it's a bit of a retro uh, comeback here. So you're so welcome to be here, as all of you are so welcome to be here, and those that are at home watching on the computers. This is the day that the Lord has made. Uh, let us rejoice and be glad in Him. Um, just quickly, if you are new to this church and you're interested in learning more about what we're all about, there are little cards here uh, in the chairs, and you're more than welcome to fill out and come chat with myself or any one of us if there's interest to, to understand more what Acton Bethel is all about. Uh, at this point, I ask you to stand as we worship our Lord. Good morning. 
you have no idea what a privilege and pleasure it is for me to be here this morning. Thank you for uh, allowing us to, to join you as a, as a family and to worship with you this morning and to help lead in worship. We're coming before this great God, and I'm reminded of what he uh, said through the prophet Isaiah. And these words are going to remind us of who this God is that we've come to worship today. This is what the high and lofty one says. He who lives forever, the one whose name is holy, the one who uh, lives in a high and holy place, and yet, and yet also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. It's almost as if God has two addresses. One is in this high and holy place. He's the, he's the exalted one. He's the one we were just singing to and about this morning, the one who is sovereign over all, the one who lives in this, in this place that is, uh, in a sense, so high that none of us can even uh, imagine what it's like to be in his holy presence. And yet, he's also the God who lives with the one who is contrite, humble, and lowly in spirit. Two addresses. God of the heavens, but also God right here. God right now. We worship him because he is the exalted one, but the way we worship him is through the spirit that he's given each and every one of us within. And so let's draw into his presence this morning with thankful hearts. Gracious God in heaven, we are amazed at uh, the wonder, the majesty, the mystery of who you are. This one who is exalted. In fact, the prophet Isaiah caught this vision of you high and lifted up with the train of your robe filling the whole temple and smoke and, and the, the, the doorposts shaking in the sight and the presence of your majesty. And yet, miracle of miracles, God, you are here today with your people. You are with the one who is humble and who comes before you acknowledging your greatness, the one who comes before you with love in their hearts for all that you have done. And so we thank you, oh God, that not only are you worthy to worship, but you are right here with us as we worship. We welcome you into this space. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand as this God greets us this morning? You know what? I'm even going to challenge you at home this morning. If you're watching live stream and you're able to stand, stand with us, one people of God together before this God who is, who is great. Standing is just one small way that we acknowledge his greatness when we stand before him. And he says to us this morning, the high and holy one says grace and mercy and peace to you as you gather together in my name, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and God's people together worshiped him by saying, amen. So, very interesting. Um, I guess I could call it a God moment, moment this week. I woke up like in the dark at four in the morning for some reason, I remembered a song that Pastor Sean's daughter, Kim, sang at their goodbye service 20-some-odd years ago. She wanted to sing, so she sang, He is Exalted. And I asked Nikki and the guys to, to put it in. So we're going to sing that song for the Lord. Uh, we're going to sing about the Lord, that He is exalted. But it was kind of cute that we had the, the Bricks connection there.
this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. You take a failure, you take a weakness, you set your treasure.
kids, it's your time to go to Sunday school. So head on to the back, find your leaders, and you'll go downstairs. Well, a number of people have asked us this morning before the service, so where did you go from here again, and what happened next? And, and so I'll give you a 30-second version. Um, many of you will remember that we left here in 2002. Folks, that's 21 years ago. That's kind of a little scary. Um, and we went to Burlington, served the New Street congregation there for... Uh, nine years, and then left for Peterborough, where I pastored at Living Hope for uh, about eight years, just over eight years. And then in January of 2020, uh, I began serving at Calvin Seminary. That's where I'm still serving, although still living just east of Peterborough, uh, because the role, even though it's, it's with the seminary, the role is a Canadian Role. My new um, role is called Canadian Church Relations Liaison. And um, before I go any further, I want to share just a little bit of an update with you at uh, Calvin or from Calvin and a little bit about my role. But before I do that, I need to say thank you um, on a whole number of different levels. Thank you, first of all, for uh, the years that we had here and the powerful influence those years were in my ministry and in my family's life, um, a first call is always a real season of being sharpened and, and formed. And uh, that happened here for me. I grew in, um, in ways that I needed to grow and in ways that the Lord wanted me to grow. And I attribute a lot of that to you and to this place. But I want to say thank you too on behalf of Kelvin and on behalf of the denomination uh, just for your giving, your faithful giving through ministry shares. Uh, ministry shares accomplish a whole lot, as you no doubt know. But part of what they do is they serve places like Calvin Seminary, which are now shaping the next generation of leaders uh, to serve our church. Through your giving, you're, you're part of that. You're actually an essential part of that. The seminary doesn't exist without without your giving. And so uh, thank you for the ways that you pray for the seminary, support the seminary. Um, let me give you a little bit of an update on what things look like at the seminary these days. Last May, at the end of last year, we graduated 61, um, 61 students, not all of them going to be pastors, uh, some of them taking a variety of degrees, but certainly the bulk of them going to be pastors, and um, those graduates came from 13 different countries around the world, Canada, of course, included. I think there were five Canadian graduates last year, if I remember correctly. So as you partner with us through your giving, through your, um, through your praying, you are literally sending out leaders around the world, 13 different countries. There's about 30 different countries represented at the, at the uh, seminary, but, but, but this last year about, uh, from the graduating class, about 13 countries. 250 students, um, just under half of them are Christian Reformed. Uh, I think most of you know Calvin Seminary is um, our denomination seminary, and so a good portion of our student body comes from the Christian Reformed Church, but obviously from a number of places, about uh, 20, 25 different denominations represented at the seminary. So it's this rich learning community. Not only uh, do you have people coming from different um, denominational backgrounds, but you have people coming from uh, different, different countries from around the world, and it creates this, um, this energy, this synergy as people come together to learn what God's doing in their lives. Um, much of our learning, especially for Canadians, much of the learning now takes place online. So about 75% of the Canadians 
who are taking their MDiv degree, which is the pastor's degree, about 75% of them um, are living in Canada. In fact, they're serving Canadian churches. They're sometimes on ministry staff. They're sometimes commissioned pastors, and they're now getting their degree, so they remain in Canada, serve in Canada, continue to serve their communities, and um, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a powerful tool for those of us who, who live at some distance from the campus. Starting tomorrow, tomorrow's January the 30th, so tomorrow is the first day of the second semester, starting tomorrow, uh, this is a brand new initiative, um, Calvin is now going to begin accepting Canadian tuition dollars at par with the American dollar. It's like a 35 to 40 percent savings for our Canadian students. So um, that's a, that's exciting news and and an indication of our of our ongoing commitment to, to uh, Canada. Actually, the formation of my position was. Uh, part of the seminary's ongoing commitment to Canada as well. It was a new position when I, when I began it three years ago. And so for the first time, the seminary has a pastor living and, and serving in Canada, uh, meeting with pastors across Canada, uh, trying to discern what it is that the church in Canada needs. And in particular, in our Canadian context, what do we need to be equipping future leaders with? to serve Canada, to serve our culture well, and to lead our churches well. So I find myself often asking pastors and other ministry leaders, how can we share our resources with you at the seminary? How can we partner with you in what you're doing in the local context? Um, how can we work together, in fact? How can we build partnerships uh, that build and that strengthen the, the, the church's mission in Canada? So that's at, at the heart of what I do, but the biggest joy in what I do, it's maybe not the biggest part of my job, but the biggest joy in what I do is meeting women and men across Canada who are sensing a call um, to vocational ministry, to ministry uh, in, in the church. And uh, you're gonna hear a little bit about that in the message when we turn there. In just a moment, I'm gonna share one of those stories from one of those students. Um, but as I meet with students, I get to celebrate these unique stories. I'm telling you right now, there's not a single, there, or sorry, there's not two stories alike. As I sit and listen and pray and help uh, men and women discern their call, I'm, I'm so struck by how uniquely God is at work in each of our lives. His, his fingerprints in your life and in mine show up in unique ways. Uh, and of course, then I get the privilege of helping them see how, um, despite their circumstances, whatever those might be, um, most of our students, the majority of them are second career students, and so a lot of them have families and have deep connections in their community, a spouse maybe who's, who's working, and, uh, but helping them see how, in fact, God's call uh, can be lived out in the context of seminary, and training for ministry regardless of, of their circumstances. Um, so that's just, a, that's just a little bit, a little taste of uh, what I do. Um, COVID, of course, threw it all for a loop, like it threw all of our lives for a loop, um, but I'm doing a lot more traveling now again and uh, able to connect with pastors. <clears throat> Excuse my voice and sinuses this morning. Able to connect with uh, pastors and, and churches in person, such a difference and such a gift this last year. Calling. That's really what my new role is about. It's about either helping people grow into their calling or helping churches grow into their calling. And it's such a deeply biblical concept. In fact, I'm going to invite us this morning to turn uh, to Exodus chapter 3, and perhaps for many of you, it's a familiar story. For those of you who have been on the Jesus journey for a while, this is probably a story that you go, I've heard this story, not once or twice before, but maybe several dozen times before. Exodus chapter 3, and when I think of calling, 
Uh, Moses is one of the names that comes to mind, and we're going to read a little bit about his calling this morning. Verses 1 to 12 from Exodus chapter 3. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word, your word of truth. This is a word. You're, 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 you're not a God who wants to remain hidden, uh, but you're a God who wants to reveal himself. You're a God who wants to be known, and it's, it's through this book that you give us the clearest sense of who it is you are and of what it is that you want to do in each of our lives and of who we are in relationship to you. And so we pray, God, that once again, as we turn to this word, as we do week after week and, and hopefully day after day as well, we pray that once again, your spirit um, will breathe new life into these words because this is not just ink on paper. These words are alive, they're active, they're sharper than any double-edged sword and they can, they can cut through bone and marrow. They can get to the very core of who we are. And so speak deeply this morning to us, Spirit of God, for we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Exodus chapter three, beginning at verse one. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that, that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and, and see this strange sight, why the, the bush doesn't burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals. For the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hittites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I? Who, who, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Thanks be to God. Excuse me, I might need to do this a few times this morning. Moses stopped. He paused. He noticed. And that was when God spoke. Like many of you, you know, I had heard this passage, I don't know how many times since the time I was this tall, and somehow I had always missed it. I had reread this this passage so many times, 
but must have, you know how sometimes we read and we're going, I know this, I know this. And we're not paying attention. But I reread it one time with fresh eyes and I noticed for the first time that I had it wrong. Moses didn't speak because he heard, it didn't stop because he heard God speak. That's what I had always assumed. But, but no, God spoke because Moses stopped. God didn't speak until Moses noticed. Noticed God at work. Noticed something unusual. And he paid attention. He turned aside, the scriptures say, and he went over to look. He was curious what God was up to. And of course, the, the more I thought about that, and maybe the more you think about that, you go, well, yeah, I mean, isn't that the way God usually works with us as well? It's typically not until I pause. So many times I, I pray for God to speak, but I'm not willing to spend the time stopping, pausing, noticing, listening. But it's when we stop, it's when we pause, it's when I choose to focus my attention on the God who's at work all around me and at work all around you that I see signs of his activity and I hear his voice. It takes intentionality. But here's the thing, it's not just when God spoke that I found interesting in this passage after Moses stopped. It's not just when, it's also what he chose to speak about once he had Moses' full attention. The very first thing that God chose to speak with Moses about was this issue of calling. That's their first conversation. Certainly in this kind of almost audible way that this passage suggests that Moses and God were interacting, the very first thing God says is, Moses, we need to talk about calling. And in fact, as I said earlier, that's where I'm inviting us to focus our attention this morning on this issue of God's calling in our lives. The God we serve is a God who invites us to follow, isn't he? And that automatically um, makes him a God of calling. He places a calling on us. He comes to Peter and he says, Peter, come follow me. He says to each of the disciples, come follow me. And as he preaches, he makes that invitation to the many, come follow me. He's a God of calling. He's a God of invitation. The God we love is a God who, is, who has formed us and who has shaped us for his purposes. He's formed us and he's shaped us for his glory. And so he calls us to enter into his work. He calls us to join him in what he's already doing in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. He says, I'm at work. Pay attention. Hear your calling. Come follow me. Now for Moses, as we read Exodus 3, you no doubt uh, sensed as I did that the calling that God was uh, inviting Moses to on this particular day was, I mean, huge. It was enormous. Go, Moses, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. I've heard my people cry. I'm aware of their pain. I've, I've seen their suffering. And I've chosen you, Moses, to be my instrument of salvation for them. Through you, I'm going to rescue my people. Through you, I'm going to save those who belong uniquely to me. I'm going to bring them out of slavery into the land that I promised them through Abraham centuries previous. Must have been daunting for Moses. I mean, this was, this was a supersized calling. But the thing I really want us to take note of this morning is this reality. Even though this was a huge calling, a daunting, a daunting calling, nevertheless, God 
I mean, this didn't come out of the blue. God didn't just reach down and speak to Moses out of the blue. And he's not likely to call you to some task completely out of the blue either. I mean, that's, that's often our fear. You hear, you know, people will say sometimes, um, you know, they're being invited by a pastor or a preacher, you know, to, to surrender their lives to God's call and people get all nervous. You know, if I, if I really surrender to God's call, I mean, might he, might he call me to some place that I really don't want to go? Or, or, or might he call me to do something that I really don't want to do? That's, that's often the fear that we approach this, this issue of calling with. But that's, that's not typically the way God's calling works. God's calling arises out of our story. In fact, if you wake up, if you wake up tomorrow morning and, and go, what was that? What was that sermon about again yesterday? If you remember absolutely nothing else, I want you to remember this. God's calling arises out of your story. Out of the story that he's already weaving in your life. See, he's, he's weaving, you've heard the image before, with tapestry, right? And God, you know, weaving the threads together, the tapestry of our lives. Um, God, is, God is this master weaver who's, who's putting together this tapestry. And when we take time to stop, you know, when we make it a habit, a pattern to really pay attention to listen to what God is doing, he will often reveal to us our calling or parts of our calling, one aspect of our calling. And what we discover when he does that is that what he invites us to actually arises out of the threads that he's already been weaving together. It doesn't come out of the blue. I mean, think about Moses especially. Could it be any more true than it was for Moses? Who better to send into Egypt? <laughs> Moses was born there. And in fact, he lived most of his life there. And who better to confront Pharaoh? He was raised in Pharaoh's courts, right? If you know the story of Moses, you know this is the story God was weaving together. But of course, of course, Moses was no uh, Egyptian, despite having spent so much of his life there, despite having been raised in Pharaoh's courts. No, he was an Israelite. And so think about this now. The only Israelite who had ever been a person of influence and privilege in Egypt was now being called back to Egypt to negotiate freedom for the people of Israel. His story, his unique journey, destined him for this calling. But it wasn't even just Moses' unique journey. It was also this deep inner sense of justice that, that lived in Moses that prepared him for this calling. Much earlier in life, you'll remember uh, that when he saw one of his own people being mistreated by an Egyptian slave driver, uh, he ended up in a fit of anger, this fit of rage. He murdered the Egyptian. That, that missed the mark entirely, of course. His, his longing uh, for justice itself, that was God-honoring, absolutely, but, but certainly not the way he chose to work toward Justice, not violence, not, not murder. But God was now going to take this, this inner sense of, of justice uh, that lived in Moses. He was now going to take that and he was going to redirect it so that um, those convictions, those convictions Moses had concerning justice would be, would be turned away from murderous purposes towards life-giving purposes the rescue of people, the salvation in that sense of people. Now here's the thing, as with Moses, so too with, with each and every one of us, 
God uses the whole package when he calls. He uses our heritage. He uses our, our life experiences, our, our personality, our passions. None of these are lost on God in the way that he's shaping us. He uses our, our genetics even, our, our skills, our gifts. He uses our current life situation, the place and the, and the time in, in which we live. He uses it all. In other words, he uses the complete you and he uses the complete me when he invites me into the tasks that he calls me to do. He's wired you uniquely for what he's calling you to do and to be. I love what, uh, what author Parker Palmer says. He says, calling doesn't come from willfulness. In other words, what he's saying there is calling is not about me choosing. It's not about me saying, I'm going to do X and I'm going to push forward until I get X done. No, he says, it doesn't, it doesn't come from willfulness. He says it comes from listening. That's where calling comes from. I must listen to my life, he says, and try to understand what it's truly all about, what the story is truly all about, or my life will never represent anything real in the world, no matter how earnest my intentions. I don't know if you're following what Parker's, what Parker's saying there, but I really think he's on to something. Discerning God's call begins with listening. Listening to God for direction, yes, of course, but, but how do you do that? How do you listen to God? Well, you begin by listening to your life. That's what Palmer would say, and I'm with him on that. Because it's in your life that God is speaking. That's where God's at work. He's at work in and through each and every one of your lives. He's speaking in and through the person that he's made you to be and through the story that he's weaving through you. So knowing what he wants for you begins with knowing who you are and with knowing, you know, who he created you to be. And then knowing the journey that he's been leading you on, the story that he's been writing in your life right from day one. One of um, the seminary students that I met with was sharing um, how God worked out his call uh, into vocational ministry. He feels led to serve the church. And he was, he was telling me stuff from when he was like four years old as he begins to tell his story. He was telling me about a conversation that he had when he was maybe 12 or 13 years old. He remembers this, this particular conversation like it was yesterday. He was telling me stuff about his first couple years at university and how he completely bombed out. Him, a straight A student, a star student, how he, how he completely wipes out in university and how he, he quits university discouraged, utterly depressed. He was telling me about how um, these expectations that he had felt that had been laid on him over the course of the life, how, how these expectations were weighing him down and how he ran to the other side of the world only to find God meeting him there. When he finally stopped running and he finally started listening told me about that and a dozen other things. And, and at the end of it all, you know, when, when all the pieces of his story were laid out, we're, we're sitting across the table from one another and I'm imagining these story, these story snippets like pieces of, of a puzzle. Once they were all laid out on the table, he could see, he said, how they all fit in one giant puzzle that God had been piecing together throughout his life. See, when he stopped, when he became curious and started, you know, wrestling with God and asking God, well, why this and why that? And, 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 and what did you mean by this? And where, where, where do you need me? And how does all this fit? When he, when he turned aside to pay attention, God spoke. And it was as, it was as if he, he says to me, everything that had ever happened in his life suddenly seemed to fit together. 
God had used it all, in his case anyways, to call him into a life of a vocational ministry. One of the ways that you'll know you're beginning to sense uh, a new step God wants you to take, a new invitation, something that he's calling you to, one of the, one of the things that will help you know you've discerned God's calling is that events or, or conversations, even from years ago perhaps, will suddenly make sense. Suddenly the pieces seem to fit. There's this sense of, there's this sense of alignment with your life and with God's desire for you. Yes, do you know what I'm talking about? You've experienced this before, I hope, more than once, where you see, where you see this sense of alignment happening. See, typically, typically God doesn't sort of jump out at you. Now, God, God's will, God's purposes for your life typically dawn on you as you speak with him. And as you look at the story of your life and as you, you listen to those deep inner passions, those convictions that God has placed there within, as you, as you listen to that, things suddenly fit, things suddenly make sense. And those moments, those moments feel like holy ground. Take off your sandals, Moses, because the place where you are standing is holy ground. Here's the surprising thing in Exodus 3 as you read these 12 verses. Despite all that, despite all that, Moses still resisted the call, <laughs> the invitation. Moses knew he was in the presence of a holy God. He had just taken off his shoes. He had just seen this bush that wouldn't it burn up. And he must have, as God began um, revealing his calling, it must have began to click for Moses. Well, yeah, what am I doing here? Tending sheep in the mountains. I'm a man of privilege and influence in Egypt. I'm a man who knows the system. I'm a man who knows Pharaoh. But still, he resists. He resists in all the same ways that you and I typically resist, right? He had a million and one doubts. He had a million and one questions. Who am I, he says, he says to God. And, and for that matter, who really are you, God? Remember, he says later on, he says, um, who should I tell them sent me? You know, I, don't, I hardly know you, God. And what if, what if they won't listen to me? What if they won't believe me? And what will I say? I mean, what if I'm not good enough? I'm not really that good of a speaker. You must have the wrong guy. Now, Moses, I think, in those moments was sensing what, what you and I already know deep down but don't always admit, and that's that God's calling, when you're stepping into it, when you're answering God's call to obedience in a given area or obedience in a, in a given task, when you're stepping out in faith, you will always feel inadequate. That's, that's the nature of the game. You know, God's calling will always take you beyond your comfort zone. God's calling will always involve risk and uncertainty. But boy, I hope you caught God's response to Moses' fears, to Moses' uncertainties. The response that he gave to Moses is, in fact, the very same response that he gives to each and every one of us in our callings. In fact, his response is always kind of a simple variation on a single theme. You can find this theme from Genesis 1 right through to the end of, of the book of Revelation. It's there on almost every page of the Bible if you're, if you're looking closely. It's the theme God repeats over and over and over again. And that single theme is this, I am with you. I'm with you. It's the promise of God's presence in our lives. Remember this God who is high and holy and lifted up is also right here with those who are lowly and contrite of heart. It's on 
almost every page of the Bible in one form or another. So here's Moses, right? Um, who am I to do that I should go to Pharaoh and, and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And here's God, verse 12, I will be with you. <laughs> That's his answer. That's God's response. It's as if that settled it. The people will follow you, Moses, because you have met with me. The people will follow you because I am with you. When you're living out of who you are, God would say to Moses, he would say to us, when you're living out of the story I've been crafting in your life, then all that matters is I am with you. This isn't about security. This isn't about success and failure. This isn't about your ego. No, this is about your faithfulness to my call in your life. It's about the promise of my presence being with you in the midst of that calling. I believe Jesus understood Moses' sense of hesitation. You know, I mean, he, he had known throughout his entire life where his ministry was headed, the cross. I mean, how many times didn't he try to tell his disciples? They rarely got it, but how many times? He knew, he knew where all of this was going to land. And yet, when push really came to shove, in, in the garden, you know, the night of his, his arrest, he wondered, didn't he, if there was some other way. I mean, he had even a sense of hesitation. He, he, he prayed that this cup might pass him by. Right? That if there be some other way, Father, any other way. See, knowing God's will, knowing God's purpose, knowing what it is God's calling you to, and then doing it, Stepping into it are two very different things, aren't they? You can have the first without, without the second. You can choose to say no. And that wasn't the case with Jesus. Because in the end, he knew your salvation and mine was his work to do. In fact, it was the story that the Father had been weaving together in his life right from the very beginning. Jesus knew, because he listened to the Father, Jesus knew his calling and he surrendered to his calling. God is calling you as well this morning. I mean, maybe, maybe he's calling you big, you know, some, some all-encompassing life task that he wants you to step into. Or, or maybe what he's calling you to right now is just one aspect of that, of that overall calling, just, just one of those good works that he prepared in advance for you to do. Doesn't that, don't those verses speak of calling, that God's prepared good works in advance for you to do? Maybe he's inviting you to step into one of those right now. But either way, big or, or a small step, either way, you're not going to hear it. You're not even going to be aware of his call unless you regularly stop. If Moses had been scrolling through Facebook that morning, he might have walked right past that burning bush, oblivious to what God was up to in the world all around him. You're not going to hear God's call unless you regularly pause to ask questions. Get curious. Take time to listen. So for you, what, what is it? What is, what is the next yes that God is inviting you to, that he's calling you to? You know, what, what step is he inviting you to take? Some of us, some of us, this is ringing because we go, yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been, I, I know what that step is. He's been nudging me for a while. Or, or what's he inviting you to give up, perhaps? What, what task is he calling you to pick up, to step into? What, 
What, re what relationship is he inviting you to, to build up, to strengthen? Whatever it is, that's between you and God. Whatever it is, I know that you'll never be able to say yes, a true yes, an obedient yes, without first reminding yourself over and over of his promise, I am with you. You need not fear the step because your God is with you. And so I want to encourage you this morning. In fact, I want to challenge you this morning to say yes. As Jesus said yes to his calling, you will never find deeper joy. You will never find fuller meaning or more lasting purpose than in that one word spoken often to God, yes. Yes, Lord, speak, for your servant is listening. Pray with me. Father, thank you that our lives are filled from beginning to end with purpose. You have a design for us and, and a design for our lives. You have a good works that you prepared in advance for us to do. In advance. If you prepared them in advance, no wonder you're weaving our story together in such a way that we're wired to do what it is that you've designed us to do. Each one of us unique. Each one of us a special set of gifts and circumstances and experiences, and yet, God, you invite us to pay attention, to look at it all, to see where the threads lead, to listen to your invitation, and to step out in faith, trusting, knowing that our God is with us. You're building the kingdom, God, but you're building it through the likes of us, these jars of clay that we, that we sang about earlier. How amazing is that? That you would choose the likes of me? That you would choose the likes of us? And yet you do. You partner with us. You, you join with us. And you say to each and every one of us here this morning, come follow me. Boy, have I got a ride for you a journey. Come follow me. Father, hear our prayers. Speak into our lives. And have us serve as obedient children of the great King, delighting in Him, rejoicing in Him. It's in His name, the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Sean. We're going to sing a song um, that it's called Here I Am, Lord. And quite honestly, we probably haven't sung this song uh, in this church since you last were here 21 years ago. It's an old song. Um, but the words are so fitting for what Pastor Sean just brought to us. And I think as we're sitting here, um, it might be fitting to just take a moment in silence and Try to hear God's call. Try to hear what he might be calling you to step out in faith into. And then we'll go in and I can ask you to stand at that time and we can sing through this song because the chorus of this song really is a response to God's call. So in order for us to, you know, sing through that chorus and sing, here I am, I am willing for you to use me, God, that it's, it's good for us to practice hearing his voice and seeing what he might be saying to each of us. So let's just take a minute and uh, sit in that first.
Jesus. Father, maker of us all, the one who knows us intimately and loves us so deeply, thank you that we're here together in this building, a collection of people who may know you well or not at all, but here we are, Lord. We've sung together, prayed together, and heard teaching from your word. May the time we've spent here bear fruit wherever we are in our lives. May the seeds sown be blessed into growth through your work, Holy Spirit. May the knowledge gained and realizations made benefit us in our decisions and actions going forward. May the music we've enjoyed go with us and lighten our hearts through the coming days. May we establish and deepen relationships as we enjoy a time of fellowship after this service. May all the children here form friendships as they associate with other kids in Sunday school and nursery. Thank you for all the things that happen in a Sunday church service, Lord, and by your grace, may we and others return here next Sunday to once again participate in this wonderful event made just for us. Thank you for the ministry of cadets, Lord. We pray that you will equip and bless the leaders in this and make it a meaningful experience for all the boys who attend. Please make Tuesday evenings a time of fun and growth for all of them. Thank you that the cadets program will be supported through our financial giving today, and may the money given be used well and go far in furthering this kingdom work. We're also able to pray together here for needs in our Bethel community. We ask for comfort for the family of Jim James who passed into glory but left behind hearts that will miss him. Father, please grant healing for John L. and that he will be able to return home from hospital soon. Please give clear minds and good memories to high school students writing exams this week. Help them put their best selves forward, Lord. We joyfully thank you for prayers that you have heard. 
Thank you that Robert, husband of Liz and father of Gina, is home and recovering. And we praise you, Lord, that Shelley's father, is, Brent, is in remission from cancer. What wonderful news to hear and share. Thank you, Lord. Father, you are the God who led the Israelites out of Egypt, who parted the Red Sea and felled the walls of Jericho. Jesus, while on earth you gave sight to the blind, healed lepers, and raised the dead. Holy Spirit, you sent your power into minds that spoke in languages they did not know. You are mighty, and we can trust you. Thank you that we can learn to know you, the God who is love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ken and Nikki and team for your leadership today. Although I'm still trying to figure out exactly what Nikki meant when she said, I don't think we've sang this song since you were here. It's a really, really old song. <laughs> God wants to bless us as he sends us on our way. So stand before him. This God who loves you, you know, we just prayed, God, you are the God of love. The reason he blesses us is because he loves us. The reason he blesses us is because he wants us to send us out into our calling in the world with power, with joy, and with that love that is his burning deep within us so that we can be that agent to others. And so he would say this morning, go, my children, my dearly loved. Go into this world into which I call you. Go to love. Go to serve. Go to respond to my call and to be my people, people who are building the kingdom for the sake of my glory. And God's people together said, Amen. Judah, the Lamb who was slain, you ascended to heaven and evermore will reign. At the end of the age, when the earth you reclaim, you will gather the nations before you. And the eyes of all men will be fixed on the Lamb who was crucified. With wisdom and mercy and justice, you'll reign at your Father's side. And the angels will cry, Hail the Lamb, who slain for the world, ruling in power. And the earth will reply, You shall reign, as the King of all kings and the Lord of all. There's a shield in our hand and a sword at our side. There's a fire in our spirits that cannot be denied. Because the Father has told us, for these you have died. For the nations who gather before you. And the ears of all men will do hear of the Lamb who was crucified. Who descended to hell yet was raised up to reign at your Father's side. Angels will cry, Hail the Lamb, who slain for the world, ruled in power. And the earth will reply, You shall reign. And the King of all kings and the Lord of all worlds, and the angels will cry. And the Lord of 